once we get into the live situation here so guys okay there we go so, so you guys um, might think i'm naked but i'm not oh there they are so hold on one second i'm just going to do a technical here guys lighting okay. look okay would you give him a thumbs up the lighting looks okay on both of us she looks gorgeous as as is and let's do a little sound check we're good with sound everybody yes we're good with sound all right so we're gonna get started and guess what today we're gonna be talking about Oh my gosh! Wait, hold Beautiful on. Let me see girl. if I can do the smile for the people. Ready? Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. The side look. So everyone, do I look like my Tinder photos? <laughs> right, right, for sure. So let's get started. So hi everyone, this is Yusai. Welcome to Let's Talk in a series I created on IGTV just this week, and it's been overwhelmingly welcome and so much support from the community. And Shishi and I actually had an offline conversation about why I created this. Is that in our community of creative people, journalists, artists, we strive at sharing, and a lot of them don't have a platform to do that. And because we both happen to be in front of television quite often and enjoy talking to people and listening to people. I thought this amazing platform um, to create. So I invite all my artist friends who have worked with me before, some I haven't, that I admire, to come on this platform and just share their story. And today, none other than Shishi Yang from in the Woo! entertainment I love capital. It. Okay, first of all, Hollywood. Inside, I have to say congratulations on this show. You're doing such an amazing job. I love watching every single video that you do. And you know, people love you because you're so candid. Something like IG Live is just so real. Obviously, you guys, this is not rehearsed at all. Uh, we are both in our houses. And just to give you an idea, take a look. I mean, look at this. I've still got my little like, slippers okay, on. Are we really going there? Because I'm in my, I'm in my pajamas box. <laughs> So what's great, I'm having this, we usually have our discussion in the mornings and today I chose to do it in the evening time because we are welcoming our Asian friends. I'm in Asia, it's about 10.30 their time in Singapore to join us and, and as you guys watch and listen, you have any questions at all, I am scroll. I am looking down and, and try to catch some of the scrolling to be able to answer some of your questions. And if we miss any of the questions, don't be worried. Um, this video will later be on YouTube, on hers as well as my well sharing content these days. And it will be living on Instagram Live as um, IGTV as well. So you can bombard her with DM, please. I tell everyone, Woo, I bombard love it. her with DM. I won't be able to answer a lot of the questions, but she will. So let me set this up. So when I wanted to have an open dialogue about culture, about what's going on with the Asian community, I couldn't think of anyone else but Shishi to join me for this conversation. I know I interview makeup artists, hairstylists, models all the time, but the person who actually gets to ask most questions is actually Shishi on the red carpet. So I'm gonna jump right in there. Everybody okay. wants to know the number one question. We'll just give you a Q&A right off the top, top of the start and we can start a conversation from there. How did you come from the East to the West? <laughs> I love that question. You know, no one has, a, no one has ever asked me that before. So um, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Nanjing, China. Um, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with China, Nanjing is like the former capital of China. It's where all the old dynasty emperors used to live. It's got you know, a lot of beautiful architecture still. So um, I was born in Nanjing, and then I lived there for six years, um, learned Mandarin, and my grandpa at the time, he actually, he used to work for the Chinese government as like a marketing slash public speaking type of a person. So he was really eloquent. You know, he taught me um, words, he taught me how to read, how to write, how to have like a vivid imagination. Uh, and then when I was six, my family, moved to Tokyo, Japan. Um, and then I came to America at the age of nine. My first So wait a minute. So when you were in Japan, did you learn Japanese? I learned a little bit like, you know, like, um, itadakimasu, anosumimase. Wait, wait, wait. The most important, if we go to a Japanese restaurant, will you be able to order for me? A little bit. Oh, that's good enough. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I can like, I can speak a little. Yeah. Mm. But then as soon as I start talking, they'll know I'm not like authentically Japanese. I'm Chinese. But you know, I know a little bit. Yeah. 
So then I um, went to uh, elementary school in Madison, Wisconsin. And that was, you guys, that was like a freaking big culture change because wow. think about it, coming from Asia and then my first stop in America is like the Midwest. And you thought, you know what the Midwest is like. Tell me I... Indiana. Tell yes. me Indiana is where we were dropped from. So my family is actually, my dad's from Fujian and my mom's from Taiwan. So when we immigrated here, we were dropped off in Terry Hill, Indiana. So <laughs> we were corn fed for sure. So corn fed, so corn fed. You know, we ate a lot of corn. We lived for all the football games, Green Bay Packers, and wow. uh, ate a lot of cheese. A lot. Right? Yeah. And then I, uh, I um, and then we moved again to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where you know it's another football nation, but it's in the East Coast. You so a migrant. You were a true migrant. Oh just... yeah, I went through, I went through a lot. And then I, I went to NYU for college for one year before transferring to UCLA, living in Los Angeles for um, like almost nine years after graduation. Wow. So it's been a, quite the journey. But was it always your journey to end up on the red carpet at the Oscars? You know, it was my wildest dream because when I was little, I, I like, so, so, okay, so I don't know if you went through a similar journey, but I actually learned English through watching television. Wow. My thought, this is a really funny question because when we first got to the United States, my favorite show to watch when my parents allowed us, I think we were learning English, was Tom and Jerry cartoon. Oh my so, God, that's so cute. But if you know Tom and Jerry cartoon, they don't speak English. Just no, they don't. No, they just music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't really good learning experience. But yes, <laughs> um, we actually would dump in a summer camp. We went to YMCA every single day. And... Oh my God, oh my gosh. I, I volunteered at YMCA. Like I took care of like the daycare center for a little bit, fed them there all we are. crackers. Oh there we are. There <laughs> so we that's are. We where... got the y Wait, do you still know the Y M C A? <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I don't know how you were growing up, and our personality are very similar. So I do tell people we're, we 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 kind of related. You know, we're we're very outgoing. We're siblings, we're, and we are atypical. What people quote unquote like to quote with Asians, right? Yes. We're we're much more outgoing, and and that for me, uh, especially growing up in in Taiwan, it was not welcome. It was actually, I was deemed to fail because mm. I didn't have the personality of a studious student. I didn't have the personality of obedience. In fact, yeah. I was very disobedient. I was kicked out of school every single day. My yeah. parents came to school just about every day. To, I went to seven grade schools to the point that I had to put me in private school and I still got kicked out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my journey in Asia. And when I came to the United States, it completely changed. And I think it has to do with the fact that teaching method is a little bit more different. It's more free yeah. spirited. And it encouraged me to ask questions and it encouraged me to challenge. Um, I may have crossed the line a few times by challenging my authority way too much when I was growing up, but it was definitely it, it was def it was an eye opener for me that mm -hmm. I could actually ask use the word why without consider being disobedient and disrespectful. Did you find that? Without yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I you know similar to you by the traditional way of looking at the success of it like a kid, right? I I didn't check any of those boxes. <laughs> you know, I failed this math section of my SAT. I think I got like 450 or something, which was <laughs> super embarrassing. You'll be because, you know, as Chinese, like, how does that even freaking happen? Um, and I remember like getting in detention. I think I was in maybe ninth or 10th grade. I forgot what I did. I really re wish I remember what I did. But I remember like I wrote a three page letter uh, to the principal to appeal for my detention. Like this oh, was unheard okay, of. Okay. You unheard and I of. Are literally twins. This yes. is what I did in college. When I didn't enjoy my grade <laughs> given to me, English literature, I appealed to the district board of my <laughs> Oh my, oh my god, that's so amazing. So I wrote, you know, in my letter, I included, I'm like, first of all, you know, what you're accusing me of is like, not the right thing. Secondly, um, I even went as far as saying, like, if you were to put me in detention to try to make an example out of me, then for, for the rest of my life, I'm gonna look at myself as a bad kid who goes to detention, which is gonna lead to like, 
a poor, you know, I was like, so I had the principal calling my parents in and they were like, listen, you know, we've never done this before, but I just want you guys to know she's either going to be super successful one day or end up in jail. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe you can have both. Who knows, right? I mean, why pick? But, you know, I just, um, I don't know. I just felt like I didn't really, like, I didn't really fit in at high school because I grew up in, like, a really um, suburban community where most of the kids, actually, I don't want to say most of the kids. If I'm honest, like, 99.5% of the kids were all white, came from, like, upper middle class. And here I was, you know, English was my second language. And um, in addition to being like an immigrant, I always, I I also moved a lot too. So I never had that like staple group of friends. So um, a lot of kids bullied me in school, you know, and it was kind of unfortunate to look back on it. I think I was really rebellious in a way, but um, I think the culture that I was surrounded by at the time also kind of pushed me to, you know, be even more rebellious. But Bullying. Let's, let's, let's address the bullying thing. Yeah. As an immigrant, I think we both can relate that. Living in middle America, not so much in New York and California, in the pockets where populations of Asians are abundance and, and you have protections of the same. Um, being in middle America, you are all alone. Uh, what mm-hmm. was it like for you? As the, the bully, how did they, how did you overcome that bully when you were that age? You know, it's hard because I think even if you were to like look back on it now, um, anyone who has ever been bullied will tell you that you don't remember what they said to you exactly, but you remember how they made you feel. Mm. You know, I I just remember like feeling so alone and so socially awkward to the point where, um, you know, I started like hiding at the library or high school's library during lunch because I didn't want to like face the anxiety of after you pay for your food, you have your tray and then you're like walking around like trying to find out where to sit, right? I, I couldn't face that for some reason. And then when the library started getting booked a little more during um, during my period, I started hiding in the bathroom because I had nowhere else to go. Um, so it was, it was really hard. And, uh, you know, there were a few nice kids who went to my high school who like kind of reached out and, um, wanted to include me, but I felt like no one really understood what I was going through. And deep down inside, I felt like I was so different. Like I was crazy and I felt like I, um, didn't belong there. So I resorted and you to didn't. online. You I didn't. didn't. Belong there. I, I went online, you guys. So, so instead of hanging out with kids. I went online, designed my first Zanga and Asian Avenue. I'm sure you know those two sites back then. <laughs> I did my first like Geo Cities website. I started connecting with like different people online. Um, and then I realized I'm like, you know what? I want to move to California because mm. all these people are from California and they look like they're freaking happy. They're loving life. They're Asian, but they're like living it up. They're not really like feeling outcasted like me. So that's how I was able to um, kind of come to the realization that it wasn't me that was the problem. It was more of like the environment I was in at the time. And, and do you remember at a very pivotal moment in your life that you know where you're going to end up? You know, uh, I never, you know, I never in my wildest dreams did I ever think, you know, like one day I would create like a media company and then I would be on CNN, HLN, the Associated Press, anchoring live from the red carpet, from the Oscars, Grammys, all these monumental Hollywood moments for such a large news agency. I never did. In fact, the first year that I was approved or credentialed to go cover the Oscars, I felt like they made a mistake. You know, I was like, oh, like, I remember standing there as soon as the red carpet began, thinking to myself, like, who the fuck let me on? You know, like, how did I, how did I calm my way up here? Like, this is so, it's so wild to me, but um, I don't take it for granted. You know, I definitely work my ass off to get to where I am today. I like really putting my dues because, you know, when I first told everyone I wanted to get into like entertainment and be an entertainment journalist, um, people didn't really support me because it was something that was so unheard of in the Chinese American society. 
You know, the first thing they think of is like, there's no stability. How are you going to get a job? Why would they hire you? You're not Ryan Seacrest. You're not, you know, you don't come from any connections in Hollywood. Um, and, and most importantly, it's so different from like being a doctor or a lawyer, something and, more traditional. And guys, quote for, for yeah. the Asians out there who live in America or living in the on the east side, this is very prevalent for a lot of people who want to get into the creative field. Because mm -hmm. for us growing up, and, and, and it's so fortunate now that you can turn on television and watch Netflix Asia, you can watch Netflix Thailand. Yeah. You can see people of the same color and same shape and same culture and same understanding and you can watch them and emulate and feel this hope. And I believe the period of time we both came to America and she is a little younger than me, guys. I will admit. <laughs> is a Mei Mei. She's my Mei Mei. She's my <laughs> sister, younger sister. But it was very hard to look on the screen and find somebody that you can relate to. And and I'll echo what, what she, she said is that when I first realized that I want to be in the entertainment industry, I didn't know. I didn't know what color I was. Mm -hmm. And I remember signing up for Central Casting. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, I did the same, too. <laughs> and when they would say, we need a white guy that's six foot three, that plays basketball, I show up. <laughs> I would show up for everything. And they would look at me like, you're crazy. But can I tell you, that's how I got into the industry. Oh I was God, a I crazy it. call. There was one call for Party of Five, a white kid who can dance and who, wow. can, who is crazy, who will jump, who, who, who will skateboard off a staircase. I never skateboarded in my life, but I do how to know how to move. And I showed up. And guess oh what? Oh, my I God. Did. I got that part and I was on there for a while and it paid for my tuition. So oh, hey! I, I truly believe that your calling card is not what other may, people make of you. Yeah. Right? You make your own calling card. And Amen. I didn't care. I didn't care. And back then, guys, there was no internet. So you call in to listen to all different descriptions for central casting. <laughs> so, and I know this about Shishi because she has a YouTube channel, guys. You guys should follow her on her YouTube channel. On her very fascinating 50 things that you should know about her, she did mention that she was on um, and, uh, and the behind the scenes, uh, the extras, to getting hired yes. as extras. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was like, it was the easiest way to make money if you're meeting LA. Yes. So while I was studying at UCLA, I signed up for central casting and, um, you know, it was like minimum wage, but if you're union, you made oh, twice the amount. And if you so bring your own amazing. clothes, you get extra $10. If you bring your own <laughs> And <laughs> if you get wet, you also get like a wet bomb, you know? <laughs> if you uh, got booked by commercials, like um, on a Saturday or a Sunday, then it's the weekend rate. And Let me tell you, there was, a, there was a lot of me doing this, leaning into the camera. <laughs> doing <this. laughs> Wanting to get bumped as a principal. I've been there too. I've been there too. And I just like, oh my God. And thinking about our journey and everything we've been through. Like, I remember. So similar. You know, it's so similar. It's so like, similar. It's so crazy. I remember like being 19 and, um, you know, I went to my first hosting agent's office for like, uh, a meeting with them, right? And they, you know, I don't want to say which agency it was, but they wrapped some of the biggest names in like broadcast at the time. And I just remember them like looking at me up and down like, and not knowing what to do with me. You know, they're like, have you thought about changing your name? Because XIXI is kind of hard and middle America don't like, they won't buy or really oh my God, I love you for this. Pronounce. You know, I, and they, they told me, they literally, one of the agents literally told me, she's like, do you know who Connie Chong is? I was like, no. Because, you know, I, like, I followed all the entertainment back then. I wasn't so into, like, journalism, journalism stuff. But she was like, you know, you should go home and, like, watch how she conducts herself. Look at the turtlenecks that she wears and uh, the way wow. that she will enunciate certain words. I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Connie was actually groundbreaking for the Asian community in this She country. was, she was. But you, Tsai, you know your meme is a little cray cray and a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this. It's, it's actually fascinating because you, you broke the mold. To me, you completely broke the oh mold. Oh my God, that's so sweet. I, I, I mean, hold on guys, look. She, this, this body, <gasps> oh this, my God. this photo shoot, so, I met Shishi on the red carpet, the Oscar of all places. The yes. one year that red carpet was in having inclusion and having a lot of diversity on there. <laughs> um, I got the diversity card and some days that diversity card does work for you. 
Yes. I was asked to be part of the red carpet coverage. And I was so proud because I was the first um, Chinese on that particular um, lane of the red carpet. And, and I got to be on for three hours. So it's not a 20 minute segment, but three mm -hmm. hours. And boy, that was the most exhilarating and most exciting. I cannot describe that feeling. And every time I see Shishi, you on that red carpet, I feel like I'm there with you because it's so Oh my God, that's so, so sweet. Awesome. You know what, Yusai, um, I remember like walking by the red carpet and seeing you and my eyes just gravitated towards you because you had this like spirit, this aura about you that was so authentic and so passionate. And I just like, I just felt so proud. Like even talking to you, I was getting goosebumps, you know? Cause you know how it is like sometimes on the red carpets so there are a lot of well-seasoned hosts who, you know, have been doing this for like decades and it doesn't excite them anymore. You know, they're just like there because it's a job. But for you, like you were proud, you were representing and you were so eloquent in the way that you were describing all the fashion hits and misses. I, I love it. it not to shade anyone else, but you didn't use the same word over and over again well, for a hundred times. Can I tell long. you a secret that my the viewers here is gonna absolutely love? So that particular season that when I got to host the red carpet, it was so timely for me and the universe was really on my side that I had happened to have worked and photographed just about every single artist that year was nominated. <gasps> wow. I did, the, I did the photography for the film circuit. Where wow, okay. No, remember, it was a no-no. You're a good photographer, you're an A-list photographer, you would never show up to shoot press yeah. pictures of wow. go to but i went to the um the the the, the tff mm. Toronto film festival yeah that festival really determines who will be on the red carpet at the oscar wow. okay and so i photographed 99 percent of people there and i know the crew the hair and makeup people and the glam team oh my so God. on the day on my red carpet you want to know why i was so comfortable and so able to be on the spot I text every single one of the talent to know when they were gonna show. I didn't talk to the publicist. I knew what red lipstick that Rachel Goodwin's gonna put on her talent. I know when Emily Blunt's gonna wear what color shoes. I have my inside track. And when but see, that's, that's that is what's so amazing, and that's what sets you apart. And those are all the hours, days, and years of hard work behind the scenes for you that a lot of audience don't get to see because you know all they see is what's on camera That's and listen amazing. i'm not a i'm not a fashion guy i shoot fashion so i have mispronounced couple words of the fashion brands and i've continued well do that but uh it listen matter. if Utah mispronounces something if he mispronounces my name i'm changing it legally <laughs> oh we need to talk about name thing i'm going to give you a little so when i first came to the united states my my English teacher gave me an American name because they thought Can that I guess? Was hard to Can say. I guess? Sure. What letter did it start with? D. David. Daniel. Oh! <laughs> you don't look like a Daniel! I was a Daniel side for a very long time. Imagine the bully when, when the karate kid came out. Oh, I was Daniel son. Oh, for a long time, long time, long time. Love you, long time. Oh my gosh! That was me. And, and, you know, it was when I started directing TV and, and commercials that my editor friend, who's now one of the premium caterer for all the for Vogue shoots and so forth. And she actually told me, she goes, you, you, you're not a Daniel. Are you crazy? You need to put your name back. <laughs> you're like, don't be racist. Why can't I be Daniel? <laughs> I'm trying to make it easier for white people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I tried with names. I was like, Jessica Yang? Veronica <laughs> Yang? <you> really? <laughs> yeah, I was like, Elizabeth Yang. I, I, didn't, I couldn't, like, I couldn't vibe with any of it because past a certain age, you can't really look at yourself as, like, any other name besides the one that everyone's been calling you. Can I tell you, there's a safety Asian name. Kimberly. Yeah, oh! <laughs> Grace or joy. <laughs> yes, they always work. Well, yes. I want to talk about fashion with you. Now, you've been on red carpet. You cover so many, many talents out there. But you yourself, people don't talk about very much. But this year in Vogue, oh I my remember God. seeing you in a, a, and also a red, a yellow, ah! a, a yellow dress. Okay, can we, first of all, dress. that photo deserves more likes on my page because did you know I had to strip ass naked on the great wall in the middle of winter to achieve that shot like y'all don't know how hard it is behind the scenes you know I but see snow 
Yeah, I wanted to have like a moment, you know, because um, the Great Wall signifies, obviously, like for our people, it signifies everything, hope, the end, the beginning. Um, it's one of the seven wonders of the world. And I just really wanted something that was shiny, uh, something like like that bright, like neon yellow color. It's so regal. Do you remember the, the designer? Uh, I, I, well, the design, yes, it's a Chinese designer, actually, yeah called Liu, uh, Liu Qi. That's nice. So you were yeah, in Liu Chinese Yeah, designer, time. yeah. And um, the yellow, so in China, Emperor. I just, wanted, oh, I just want ooh, people to see that. Look at that <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to give you my leg here. <laughs> OK, so in China, the emperor translated to Mandarin is Huang Di. And Huang is like the yellow color. Yes. So I just wanted something. You know, I wanted like a little golden moment. And, and what a moment. And that golden moment translated over to you on the red carpet. Ah, yes, it did. I um, I actually uh, got, I wanted like an international uh, designer for the red carpet um, because, you know, this year, one of the hottest stories was like the lack of diversity, again, by the Academy, by the Oscars. So I really wanted to represent, you know, because um, I don't take it for granted letting someone with a name as ethnic as Xi Xi Yang in. Like, honey, every time I cover the Oscars, I pretend like it's my last year. And you never know. You never know when you're going to be invited back. So I was like, fuck it. Sorry for my French. But I was like, let me live this up. You know, this is my moment. I'm going to own it. So I um, went to Janusha Zara, who is a Serbian designer. I had this beautiful idea of kind of like a, uh, a, a like bell of the ball look inspired by Beauty and the Beast. And then, you know, she brought the vision to life. And can I tell you, I almost didn't get my dress on time. Wow. Yeah, I almost didn't get in on time because um, I was like flying to LA and uh, I think her assistant accidentally miscalculated the fact that Russia was like a day uh, or Serbia wow. was a day ahead, eight hours ahead, you know, they had like, so they miscalculated the date. Anyways, um, I did get the dress and it was so beautiful and I can't believe it. Like it was my first time being included in Vogue's Oscars. Oh, and Harvard. I loved so that it. Was amazing. Because they were able, they would they turn the camera to somebody who always been behind the camera, right? You were always yeah. behind the camera interviewing everybody else, talk to everyone. And it was it I was I was so proud of that moment for you. And the fact that 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 they're recognizing that not just the people who on walk in the red carpet, who people have been standing there for guys, they stand there for at least eight hours before anybody even shows up to talk to them. I the know, homework that I you know. have to do. And, and when people finally come, we have to pretend like we just got there. <laughs> yes. So let's, I'm going to give you guys a little walk because I've been in this situation is that the Oscars and Emmys and all that, they were amazing, but Oscar is the, the creme of the creme. So uh, yeah. the carpet is set a day ahead of time and we, we get the luxury to go and walk on the red carpet, kind of scout out the place and see how it's going to be. But a day off, it, it, before you even show up, the amount of homework that she, she has to do before she gets there. I got a folder this thick, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. And then I had to, you have to do <laughs> teleprompters. I'm all, okay, let's not, let's make sure they know, they don't know I can't really do that. But I had to learn really quickly, and thank god yeah. I have my text messages with my friends. But, yeah. but when you get there, one, there's anxiety, two, that everybody's so excited and right. what i love about what you do you are always so excited in general but you take to the level that you never go over and you mm -hmm. don't get because when you get too excited for them they get nervous they get anxious yeah that was about your experience as a journalist how do you balance the energy up with people like let's say tom hanks oh you say you're so good that is such a good question first of all um so I always like to make my subject feel like the star. And people, whoever is walking the red carpet at the Oscars deserves to feel that way. Because mm. think about it, you work your whole life, okay? You work your whole life, so many things you have to sacrifice to uh, being in the industry. And finally, here's a once in a lifetime moment where the Academy is honoring you, honoring that project that you're part of. and. It, this might be your only year at the Oscars. So I really want uh, those people who have put in so much work to feel validated, you know? Mm -hmm. So I always go above and beyond in my research skills. Um, a lot of people think, oh, red carpets are easy. You just show up, you wing the questions. That's not 
honey, you can't fake it till we make it at the Oscars, right? You have to know what projects they were nominated for, how many times they've nominated, they've been nominated, uh, would this be their first win, how many wins they've had in the past, what else they're working on, how is this, you know, movie relating to some of the uh, societal changes we're experiencing, everything. And don't forget, everything. So, yeah, so much research. Of hundreds of reporters are out there guys asking the same question and as a good journalist you have to figure out how to ask those questions differently and still excite excite them to give us a, 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 a same, perhaps the same answer yeah. but in a different yeah. way but you I, thought, see, I see that. i see yeah. you there arm wrestling people high-fiving people <laughs> booty check people, I mean. But you know what, Yusa, I see the same passion in you as you're photographing some of the biggest celebrities, supermodels, and legends in the fashion industry, you know? You've like, I mean, everyone from like, one of my biggest girl crushes, I interviewed her by the way, of Priyanka Jonas. Oh, oh my gosh, she's so gorgeous. To like Cindy Crawford and these people, they, they've been shot their whole life, but when, they are in front of your lens. You're able to bring that excitement out in them. You know, almost like they're doing a photo shoot for the first time. Exactly. I see that in you too. Thank you so much. And I love that. And and let's talk about beauty because I think it's really important that when I say you broke the mold and I mean the mold in so many different ways, you you have a curvy body. Let's just talk yes, about I your, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Your curvy body and you're booty licious and you got, you got <laughs> this and you have that. <laughs> Did you feel we want to figure that, but we'll work on it with some squats. When you were growing up, what was it like for your body image? When you when you step into the camera for the first time, mm -hmm. being in front of the camera, were you judged and did people ask you to change your body? Oh my gosh, yeah. Every, oh my gosh, every day I'm still going through it. Um, I remember like stepping in front of the camera for the first time, I felt really fat. You know, like I just... It's hard because Chinese, I think um, if you grew up in like a Chinese family, you know, in the Chinese culture, first of all, people do not hold back when it comes to making judgments about your weight. You know, like even my own parents will be like, oh, she, she, uh, you got fat. Oh, are you stressed? <laughs> Is it stress that's making you fat? Like, no, no shame whatsoever. Okay. So there's that brutal honesty. But also, I feel like it's so weird because I feel like Asian cultures have this fascination with like a um like a pre-puberty body mm. you know they want you to look so stick thin almost like you never went through puberty like you're still 14 years old and you know obviously as women our bodies change um who like the shape of our body and the condition that our bodies are in at the age of 19 is not the same as 29 39 49 right so i feel like there's beauty in all ages and to me I don't really believe in having to fit into like a specific standard of beauty for having a body because, you know, like why are boobs ugly, right? Like why can I not show off my boobs? Why <laughs> You're not? talking to a photographer who shoots them for a living. <laughs> right? Like, you know, why is it something that we have to be like, why is it something that we have to hide? Why is it bad to have boobs? I but, mean, like, but, think about but, it. Think about it from like, a you, you majored in bio biology. Yes. From like a biological standpoint, women have to breastfeed and this is like a huge part of nature it's just so wild to me how um women still you know certain cultures especially like still hold themselves to this like standard of beauty that's at the end of the day unattainable but do you feel like you're so westernized now that you toss that concept of asian beauty aside and live the western beauty i try to until you know i pick up a call from my parents and they're still like, she, she, you put on 10 pounds, but you know? Isn't it, it's, to me, it's such a, it's such a, uh, a pull because Asians that we love to eat and we love yeah. to eat people. And then the first to tell us we ate too much. <laughs> We're yes, back. yes, yes. You know, you know, what my, you know what my mom says nowadays? She goes, ah, she, she, you know, uh, people don't die from being hungry. They die from oh, eating. <laughs> Bad. like why are you telling me this <laughs> but you know I just I, I know like at the end of the day I talk about body positivity a lot on my channel I know look you know my body by American standard is still it's curvy but it's still petite because usually I range from like small to medium mostly on the small side um but in the Asian culture oh my god when I try to buy like a cheap pao which is like the traditional Chinese gown 
you tie. I couldn't even fit into extra large. Oh. Like, I mean, let, I'm telling, like, I was at the store. Okay, I tried to put it on, and then it got stuck here. I couldn't like push it down. They're not I don't even know what to do. They're pretty much chastity belts for you. <laughs> yeah, it's so like, and then the woman she didn't want to like say no to my money, right? She was like, "Oh, it's okay. We could custom order one for you. Get delivered tomorrow." I was like, "No, forget it. I don't want to buy it. Like this is extra large and it can't even fit. Are you kidding me?" So you know, when, I, um, when did this this confidence? When where did you get this confidence? For our viewers, for the girls out there. Who mm -hmm. want to be in front of camera? Who ask, "Am I too fat? Am I too skinny?" Especially the Asian audience that we have. What do you say to them? I say, you know, it's first of all, it's your life. You know, you have to really own who you are because if you don't own who you are, others will always have different opinions about how you should be, and that's the truth. You know, one minute people will tell you you're too big, next minute people will tell you you're too skinny, and you know I even got criticized because I'm tan and a lot of like uh, the no 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 work. look at this skin color this is tan <laughs> but you know how it is like in the Chinese culture if you have if you have like olive skin like you and I do you know people think we work in the rice paddies. You know, people don't think we're like aristocrats who can afford to not work and just be <laughs> indoor for whatever reason that is. So I just, you know, I, I think I went through a period in my life where I just got fed up with it, and I um, gained more confidence the more success I started achieving in my career. I started realizing, like, you know, why chase something that's so unattainable when it's not me? Again, it's not me that's the problem. It's more of the perspectives of how others are viewing. <laughs> me and why am I allowing their insecurities to weigh me down at the end of the day they're not me so why am I giving them that much power and well said because we need we I, I think I, I actually thank Kim Kardashian clan to actually I do too. to put the curviness out there and yeah and as controversial as they are that I photograph them from day one and I and they are the most courageous people I have to say and yeah. the, the the language and the conversation they create good or bad with spectrum wherever you at one thing that I do appreciate is that that they embrace their body and they, they do the body or who they, they really are do. and there's so many of you out there and that that needs that I mean yeah. I, I I wish I desire to have those lips and the cheeks and the butts but it yeah. doesn't fit this frame very well <laughs> <laughs> but you thought, you know, you shot so many big fashion figures and you know, like in the world of fashion, everything goes in cycle, you know, like plot more plum women were popular at one point. That was a standard of beauty. And then but in yet, the 90s, it was like, you know, it was more like Twiggy, like the stick thin K Moss look, the whole like, oh, I'm OG'd on cocaine, but Yeah, we went know, for the like, grunge, we went for, well, I, I love that what's happening now in our in our society, in, 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 a, in a Western society that's em embracing the shapes and body. I still think that we have a lot of learning to do, embracing color, that if we can get everybody to be more colorblind, if, especially in the climate we are today, that how mm -hmm. many Asians are being focused on because the epidemic that we're in right now. Do you, do you, do you find that? That's shocking still. And you've been in this, this, this industry for so long. You talk to every color and skin possible already. Do you find that we're still having this problem shocking? To be honest, uh, yes. But at the same time, no. Because I do know, like, you know, I feel like something really had to happen on a major scale for Asians to come together, unite, put aside all their differences, and have a stronger voice. You know, because we're, we're taught to be like, we're taught to be demure. We're taught to not cause any problems. You know, and, and that's too late. Like, I know that that was not the case for you and I missed that memo. But you know, with my parents, they're immigrants, and they have the mentality that's like, you know, like, oh, don't cause any trouble. You know, don't cause any trouble. It's okay if someone wrongs you, forgive them. No, I'm kind of like, no, fuck that. Right. But, but, <laughs> but you what, know, so so I feel like we have to, you know, there had to be like a tipping, tick, uh, like a tipping point where we have to realize like enough is enough, and we have to kind of, you know, stand up about some of the racist um, things that are said or being portrayed. 
Yeah. Do you, I mean, I feel responsible that at this time that we actually she embraced a community and mm -hmm. reached out to a community and, and support each other in, in whatever way it is. Like we're supporting each other today. I, I think we, we, it's still so lacking for me. I feel like when we talk about diversity, all of a sudden crazy rich Asians open up a conversation. And I remember yeah. a white friend said to me when, when that movie came out and called me and said, I didn't know Asians were so funny. And <gasps> I responded to him, I didn't know why people are so dumb sometimes. <gasps> because what you just said to me is the dumbest thing I ever heard. And, and yeah. but, but that is what, what this, this, this world that we continue to fight. And, and for you guys in the east side of the country, um, to come to America, want to make it here, it is you you have to work really 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 right. hard you may not right. be crazy as us but you better have an amazing thick skin and maybe that's why our skin is so olive because we have to keep it thick and strong but it is it is not easy because even now today i feel in hollywood there's still a checklist all right mm -hmm. abc network we have one asian that's enough nbc we have one show that including asian location that's enough and yeah the crazy thing to me there are more Asian in this world, including mm -hmm. India, when I say Asia, by the way, guys, and there's more population. Than yeah, Asia, amen, that, amen. That we, we need representation in all aspects. And, and I do believe in this. I don't believe in representation for representation's sake. I do think talent does have to come with it. And, yes. and you can't just hold your flag up, I'm Asian and I deserve this part, yeah. I should have this job. And you have to work really, really hard. And, and this comes down to my career when I first when I first wanted to become a photographer, there was Walter Chin, who was shooting Vogue in the 90s. And that was the only Asian photographer that I recognized. And that, that was my inspiration to say, okay, there's one Asian person who can do this. I can do this. So right. whatever it takes for you guys out there to find that commonality that you can relate to, please do. Mm -hmm. I never ever imagined that I would be in front of television. I wanted <laughs> I was a drama kid. I was a guy that you walk by during lunchtime and standing against a corner, memorize his lines, and you can throw shoes at my head and I would never even move because I was so focused on studying my line for music. Oh my band. gosh. So I was that guy and I was the most awkward human being. And I wanted it. I wanted to be on TV. I auditioned. Oh, oh did, I, did I lose you, Shishi? Yay, then, we're back. back. The conversation was getting so juicy. <laughs> so we're talking about how... Um, how different I was in, in school and how I was, I was so, when I look back, I always tell people, I don't know, I should kick myself or hug myself because I was that guy that was so awkward that I couldn't blame other people for looking at me like weird. And, mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I love honestly it. Honestly, wouldn't change a thing. And, and it was not easy going through high school. It was not easy going through uh, adolescence and, and, English being second language. I actually grew up in Chino, California, for those guys who know Chino, Ooh, California. Oh, Chino, okay, Chino Hills. So we're talk oh, this is before Chino Hill existed. Oh, so okay. we're talking about 95% um, Hispanic community. And so I actually blend in pretty well in terms of my shade of color. But culturally, I, I wasn't Hispanic, obviously. And it was, it was hard, it was difficult. There was always, my favorite place that you hide in a bathroom, I hide in a farm. So Aww. I was a future farmer's America and yeah. I would go eat my lunch with the pigs and the cows and the sheep. And that's where I felt like I belonged. Aww. So, but you know what, with all that, I, I absolutely would not change a thing. And I never thought that, that we would have this moment. It is absolutely, mm -hmm. you never know, you know, your cards are dealt how you want to play it. Right. When you exactly, poker yeah. table, exactly. You can yeah. just say, yeah. hit me. Or you can just yeah. go all in. And, my philosophy is always all in. What you got to lose, you know? I love it. I Oh, my God. That's so – just so, when you were saying that, I'm getting, like, goosebumps. It's so true. You know, at the end of the day, if you look at, like – if you look at the moment that you're born and then you look at the last day in your life, every single one of us, regardless of whether we realize it or not, have a limited amount of years, days, hours, minutes down to the second, right? So for me, I've always wanted to um, leave a mark, Le leave a mark. If my story could inspire just one person to really go for it, despite all the odds, I feel like it will be worth it for me. You know, nothing was ever in my favor. I was not the girl who, you know, went to auditions and nailed auditions. That was not me. You know, I, I never like, I don't know, I, I, I never like walked around a mall and just got discovered and
was put on TV. That's not me. So literally every step I've had to like build my own vehicle, drive it to the next stop and then figure out like, okay, what am I going to do next? How am I going to progress and blah, blah, blah. But the feelings of feeling like um, we never quite fit in, it's those moments that really gave me fuel and propelled me to create the life that I've always wanted to have. I still feel like an outsider all the time. <laughs> I do. I still go, they haven't figured it out yet. Nobody tell them. I'm not supposed to be invited to this party. Like you said, on the red carpet, you're like, am I going to get fired? And then should I be here? But it, it, on the red carpet, I'm like, do they know who they hired? <laughs> well, so, so with that being said, what's next? What, what, what is your hope and dreams to be next? Now you broke the mold. Oh what's God, the next so thing to crazy. conquer? I, you know, I just, um, I want to keep pushing because what excites me the most now, because in the beginning of my career, I was excited about the fact that, you know, I got to go to A, B, C, X, Y, and Z events. And I got a selfie with, you know, Angelina Jolie, got a selfie with Kim Kardashian. Oh my God, look at me. I'm so cool. But, so the beginning part of my career was very self-serving, right? Now I'm going through a phase where it's not about me anymore. The older I get, the more interested I am in other people and other things. So I want to be able to build more things and create more opportunities that can pave way for the new generation. You know, I love it when I get like a comment in my DM from um, someone who's like, you know what, Shishi, like, I love watching your stuff. Um, I've always wanted to have a career like you, but my parents said, don't do it. Be a doctor, be a lawyer. I'm like, you'll have a lot more fun doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so I really want to, you know, do something that can help usher in like the younger generation and to keep pushing for this big momentum that us Asian Americans and Asians all over the world are gaining in the world right now. Well, interviewing you and talking to you, having a conversation with you, we cannot not ask this question. Give me a juicy gossip of the best celebrity gossip you got. <laughs> oh you my know gosh. them all. <laughs> that is such a good question. Okay, the best celebrity gossip that I have. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, that's so, mm. That's a really good one. That I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Um, <sighs> oh, I got you good. <laughs> you got me real good. Okay. Um, let's just say, I know some people's butts are not real. Okay. I like that one. <laughs> and I know exactly down to how many units, how many units of a little certain something that's been pumped in. So okay. we'll just leave it at that. Wow. Well, as a photographer, you know I see everything. So I think we share the <laughs> same secrets. <laughs> I know. And you're like, oh, it's real. That's, oh, it doesn't jiggle. It doesn't move. And it gets bigger every year. <laughs> no, it's been. So this, let me ask you, so what, what now? When's the vehicle now? In a climate we are today, you are used to being in the face of people, microphone in their face, two feet away, asking all their questions, engage them, touching them, holding them, hugging them. You are a social person. How do you deal with that now? Well, for, that's a great question. First of all, it's not two feet away anymore. It's got to be at least six feet away because, you know, social distancing and it's Corona time. Um, I... You know, we're going through an interesting time. We're going through an interesting time where, for me, the future of entertainment news has to be something that has value. You know, people are done. People are done with all the tabloid stuff, I, which I've never been a big fan of. Because, you know, to me, it's not like, it's not fun for me to sit there and be like, so did you really hook up with so-and-so? You know, like, it's not fun to destroy people's lives. I've always stood for positivity. So to me, there's been so much content created, but people are really looking for value. They're looking for like, what can I learn by watching this? What can I see or realize about myself by watching this? Which is essentially, if you think about it, you know, that's what we go to the movies for. That's why we love watching movies, why we love watching TV shows, because we want to be able to see ourselves, right? But I also think so, exactly what you're saying is that it's, it's, the, it's, it's the most crucial time for anyone, and then we know <laughs> everybody's on IG Live right now and all that, is to show your authenticity. It's funny yes. to me, it's so crazy that what Instagram has created is for people yes. to be someone else. Right? It is an instant of you think I am with this filter. You think I am with this eyebrow. You think, and right now, 
the, all that barrier is coming down because you don't have the team to make the hair and makeup to make it who you are. And I couldn't be happier to see celebrities get on. This is own. my this is my lockdown nails. I peeled yeah. off my gel because I can go see my nail tech. I I love what you're saying, Yuzai, because you know. Um, in the beginning, social media was really organic. That's what social media was. It was another platform of media that's meant to be like instant, right? But somehow in the, like through the process of growing social media, it got to be so competitive and plastic. planned, right? Plastic. Planned. Yeah. Like plastic. And I always tell people, you know, make sure your Instagram and social media reflects your life. Don't live your life trying to fake these IG moments. It's not worth it. Don't post about a moment unless you actually live and I, it. And I think now the transparency is there now for whatever color you are, Asian, white, black, whatever race you are, that that right now we can see all of you in a more transparent way. And in fact, the yeah. ones that, who are still faking it, I hate to tell you guys, you're not making it. And, it's, and I, you're not because one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation with you because you are in front of a lot of people who who do fake it really, really well. And you know, you know when you you know I, I know I do know you know I do know and you can't you can't get far by faking it because now um, people want to know just like not not just. Uh, uh, you know, what kind of projects you've been in, but people want to know, like, what you stand for and who you are behind the scenes. The whole, like, smoke and mirror of Hollywood is gone. Now it's all about being authentic. People know celebrities are just like us, right. too. Public figures are just like us. You know, what are their vulnerable moments? What are they insecure about? Let's talk about it. It's not just like, oh, I'm perfect. This is me. Everything was handed to me. And that the end. You know, that's not, that's, no one wants that. Let's be real. But listen, we all would like a little bit of ring light to help us look pretty. That that's okay. Because <laughs> I got the right Amen. Over <laughs> Any way that we can feel good and get up and every day, and and that's that is that is so ever important. But I'm so happy to have a conversation to you, with you today. We have a lot more we can talk about while hours almost up. But I want I want to ask a couple of questions before our hours up, and that is let's do it. That so for for me, and I still wake up every day and reminded I'm Asian by something, mm. by either by the external of negativity or by whatever's on the news. And sometimes that just, it, it has become a block, a roadblock. Mm -hmm. Do you experience that? And if you do, how do you step over that? Oh my God, that is a great question. Um, I'm reminded of it, not just, um, you know, especially with everything that's going on right now, obviously like with the lockdown, um, I, I just feel like there's so many bad uh, stereotypes and things like nasty things being said about Asians. Um, I overcome it by thinking that it's not me, it's them. And what I should do is keep spreading love and positivity because it's not my fault that they're ignorant because based off of their own experiences, but instead I should teach them to be more open-minded and more positive. We have to lead with love. We can't fight negativity with negativity. If someone says something ignorant to us, about us, or even give us a dirty look, if we were to, you know, stoop on their level and do the same, then nothing gets done. So instead, I feel like we should open up a conversation and lead with positivity. I love that. And I love that you leave the viewers with a, such a positive thought. Now, one last thing I will tell you, I want to that I thought, I saw on your YouTube that you love hot sauce. Oh my God, I do. And you carry it everywhere you go. So this I is do. how crazy it is. This is how connected we are. I have been making a hot sauce that's going to go to market. <gasps> it's my <gasps> special hot sauce. And I wasn't oh going to it until I saw it last night on your 50 things to know about Shishi. Oh my all God. Here. So... You will be one of my first that was sent to you. I will tell you that Priyanka approved, Cynthia, Cindy Cropper approved, Chrissy Teigen approved. They all taste it and they're like, this is good. Oh my so God, is it, like, is it like an Asian hot sauce? Yes, it is hot, hot, hot. It's a fusion Asian hot sauce that gives you the sweetness to the spiciness all in one bite. You, I, I, you can't say, I, need a, I need a sauce that can cure all the disease. <laughs> as soon as I put you it in me, it do? goes right through. That's what I need, okay? I can tell you that at least it'll bring you happiness and joy. I can tell you that it would cure what's going on, but it definitely brings some joy to your food and your eating process. And you know what? Next time we talk, I hope we can talk about 
food because I know you're a foodie and you love to cook and I love We should do food. a mukbang. We should. We should oh do it. Oh my god, we should like eat and chat at the same We're time. We're doing double feature because people loving and I'm loving you. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. Wait, what's the pretty filter? Hold on. I just put a pretty filter on. Look at this. I didn't oh. know I could do Oh, there we go. We should have done that the first hour. <laughs> yeah, we need a redo. We need a redo. You said, oh, these are fun. Oh, I got freckles now. You do. You do. Yay. So I, what we left off, what we're talking about is the, the, the spreading the positivity in the community that we're in, whether it's mm -hmm. in media, whatever community we are in. And I, and with that, and I want to talk about a dear friend of ours, and he's actually going to come on the show uh, in a week <gasps> or so, and that's Michael Costello. And, and I actually met him on the red carpet as well with you. And I Listen, Michael is like my other brother. He's my best friend. I love him so much. Um, and he's so, you know what he's doing right now, Yutai? Incredible he's in his things. Fact, okay, so he's in his showroom in downtown LA, which he turned into like a part factory. He's literally sitting there in front of the sewing machine, sewing masks. I it's asked him, incredible. I was like, Michael, this is so, I was like, what prompted you to do this? What made you want to get into it? Because, you know, your background is like being a celebrity fashion designer, doing couture gowns for all kinds of like A-list celebrities. And he was like, well... I mean, it's better than, you know, getting fat watching Netflix. <laughs> and he said something that, like, just stuck with me and just, like, really inspired me. He said, I figured if I can't do what I want to do, then I can at least do what I can. You know what? It's so inspiring. And we, we all do a little bit of what we can do. And, and I'm hoping that this show, this format, these dialogues that I can keep having with people like you and friends who have been working with me that continue to remind them what they do does matter, what we do does matter. Just because it's not accessible to us now, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's going to go away forever. And, and I, I'm looking forward to what this world becomes on the next stage. Because we are learning now the behavior we're doing the lockdown is making the dolphins swim again to the mm -hmm. mountains and the lakes, and then we can actually see clouds we've never seen before. Maybe this will bring some awareness in the environment mm -hmm. that we can be a little bit more cautious about. Maybe this is just a reminder of humanity that we all Amen. can learn from. Amen. You know? I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. So, um, you know, in the Japanese culture, you know, you've seen the movie Godzilla, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Godzilla, Godzilla in Japanese actually stands for like the force of nature that is supposed to restore balance and reset everything, right? I think everything happens for a reason. And I think we got to the point in our society, in humanity, where we were trying to outrace nature. You know, we're always up on a, the latest technological advances. We want the new iPhone. We want the new thing, this, that, everything faster, blah, blah, blah. But at the end, end, end of the day, like, we can never outrun nature or compete with this. So I think um, one blessing and one lesson that we can learn from being in the lockdown is, you know, we should reflect about the footprint and how much of an impact that we're leaving and how much damage we're doing to Mother Earth. And this is that's like a chance for all of us to be positivity. Said. Yes, and that's spreading positivity. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being with me. I know you're in the New York time zone, so you're going to go to bed soon. <laughs> but I couldn't be happier to be here with you. And we will have it again and again, because I think we have a lot more to talk about. Because next time, I want you to prepare, more prepare, to answer those gossip questions of all the celebrities that you know. <laughs> And we can compare notes. I love it. Well, that, well, uh, <laughs> and pretty soon I'm going to be able to try your hot sauce. So I can't wait. Yes. I'll get them over to you. I'll send them over to you. Thank you. Good, thank it. you so much. And thank you guys, everyone, who have joined us on the east side and the west side. And we'll continue our conversation. And remember, keep talking. This mm -hmm. is the way we can socialize. And don't distance yourself so much that you disappear because we want to hear from you. So let's keep talking. And thank you again. Shishi, I will see you soon. I love you. Oh, I love you, Yuzai. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Guys, stay strong and stay healthy out there. Bye-bye.